Welcome to our special symposium this afternoon to highlight the University Honors College. I'm very pleased to be with you all this afternoon to have all of our special guests in the room. As we know, Boston University is a very special place for undergraduate education. Today we are a major research university with leading faculty in all the disciplines represented in our schools and colleges. Simultaneously, we are an institution dedicated to the most rigorous undergraduate education that offers a combination of a great liberal arts experience and the possibility for professional education, thereby providing our students for citizenship in the world and for launching their careers. The University Honors College was designed by our faculty to create a special environment for the brightest and most ambitious of our undergraduate students. Here they are to have access to very special, a very special general education that combines contextualized disciplinary content and learning integrated with the process of discovery, all while continuing to give students access to all that Boston University has to offer in all its schools and colleges. Equally as important, the Honors College forms a small residential community of students who are dedicated to learning together and who are working to grasp all of Boston University. Today, we are here to celebrate the founding of the University Honors College and to make a very special announcement. Today, we are announcing that trustee and Boston University alumnus, Rajan Kilachan, who's sitting on the front row, graduate of School of Management 1974, has pledged a gift of $25 million, the largest gift in Boston University's history, to endow the University Honors College in the name of his, his parents. <laughs> On the vote of the trustees of Boston University taken this morning, I am pleased to announce that the University Honors College henceforth will be named the Arvin and Chandan Nandal Kilachan Honors College. Kilachan Honors College for short. <laughs> in, endowed in loving memory by son Rajan Kilachan. This is a landmark day for the Honors College and for Boston University. Through the vision and support of Rajan and the creati creativity and energy of our faculty, the Kilachan Honors College is positioned to educate the best of future generations of Boston University students. Today, we have assembled an outstanding group of the University uh, Honors College faculty to mark this day, and I'm pleased to introduce Charles Delheim, director of the Kilachan Honors College, to make remarks and introduce our speakers. Charles? <laughs> When Gandhi was asked what he thought of Western civilization, he replied, it would be a very good idea. <laughs> Gandhi's quip calls attention to the rift between the West's espoused values and its actual conduct. On the one hand, its commitment to reason, science, law, and freedom. On the other hand, its treatment of colonial peoples. What Gandhi said of Western civilization applies in a certain sense, to the state of higher education today. Higher education remains a very good idea, but one in need of renewal and redefinition for a new century. This is a critical moment. Since 1945, our colleges and universities have become the finest in the world. They have opened the doors to countless people and groups, provided opportunities for self-discovery and social mobility, fueled the research that has helped create the computer and biotechnology industries. These achievements are now in jeopardy. Financial stringency threatens access to higher education and the funds needed to sustain its excellence. The recession has provoked concern about whether degrees really translate into desirable careers. Even so, we cannot afford to focus on the formidable external problems that face us. We can't afford to dismiss our critics simply as Philistines, and we can't assume that the value of what we do is self-evident. We also face 
some internal obstacles that are worth talking about. In a memorable talk at the Royal Society in London that I had the privilege of attending, Jonathan Cole offered his own subtle diagnosis, and he also quoted a very relevant cartoon from Pogo, which says, we have met the enemy, and he is us. Us in this context means university faculty and administrators. The good news is that we are the architects of our own fortunes and we have the power to transform the university as we want to. Higher education is not immune from the profound changes that are sweeping through the worlds of business and politics. The modern research university is about the same age as the modern managerial corporation. 1870 to about 1910. Our aims are very different, but our problems are in some respects similar. We both suffer from institutional rigidities that impede our ability to innovate. As the late economist Manker Olson demonstrated in the book called The Rise and Decline of Nations, the growth of entrenched interest groups undermines the common good over time and contributes to national decline. Take, for instance, General Motors. It took General Motors leadership 40 years and the threat of closure to recognize that the remarkable engine of innovation that had been built by Alfred Sloan had become more complacent than remarkable and was building vehicles that were mediocre. Nevertheless, General Motors was bailed out to good effect, it seems. Many colleges may not be so lucky. The established structure of the modern university, its division into schools, departments, and colleges, serves very useful purposes, but at times it can create harmful barriers. We cannot afford to let internal competition for scarce resources block university-wide competition. Did I say competition? Co cooperation. That was a really bad, a really bad Freudian slip. That's called, a that's called a parapraxis for your taking count. We also can't afford to act, as the Cambridge classicist F.M. Cornford put it, in 1911, as if nothing should be done for the first time. We counsel our students rightly to go outside of their comfort zones. We should do the same. We extol critical thinking. We need to apply it to our own practices. The Kilishan Honors College provides Boston University with an extraordinary opportunity, an opportunity to take the lead in addressing the big questions that address higher education and society. I'll be honest, we would have been very grateful for this gift even if we hadn't known the donor, but we could not be more thrilled to have had the chance to get to know Rajan and his family and to know that the Kilachan name will be with this college in perpetuity. As a son who is forever grateful to his own parents for making sure that I received the wonderful education that was denied them, let me say how moved I am by this wonderful gesture of memory to your parents, Rajan. The faculty and students of this college are in a remarkably good situation. Uh, we are an um, enviable situation, really, of entering into an arranged marriage that turns out to be a perfect match. For the Kilichans bring us many gifts. They bring wisdom, uh, generosity, kindness, humanity, reverence for learning, and knowing when to take risks and how to take risks. As the world's newest college, we could borrow our motto from E.M. Foster's novel, on Howard's End. The motto is, only connect. First, we are trying to connect faculty and students across the university to fashion a community dedicated to innovation and imagination. As the sociologist Ronald Burt writes, quote, people who live in the intersection of social worlds are at the higher risk of having good ideas, unquote. This means that by spanning the structural holes between groups, this college provides a basis or a site for cooperative, rigorous experimentation for the entire university. 
Second, we want to connect the arts, sciences, and professions in a different way to create a new notion of what a liberal education is, a notion in which the usual divide between pure knowledge and applied knowledge begins to fade away. We want to prepare our students to enter a world where they'll have to muster a variety of approaches, the approaches of anthropology, psychology, politics, engineering, as you told us in Dubai, Rajan, among others, to address the complex problems before us. Finally, we want to connect research and teaching as closely as possible. This entails exposing students to the creative work of their professors early on and fostering their ability to do creative work of their own both before and after they leave here. It is no longer morning in America it is closer to high noon, and we will have to fight for the things that we care about, or we may lose them. The world needs its universities, and universities need new ways of unleashing the enormous creative power within us. So on this special day, let us dedicate ourselves with humility, honor, and humor to the task ahead, the pursuit of learning, the quest for truth, and the dedication to humanity that remains the heart of all true education. I want our students and faculty to know how proud I am of them and how grateful I am for their support. I want my brothers in arms, Andy Cohn and Jim Schmidt, to know how much I appreciate the extraordinary efforts that were essential to making this college what it is today. Now please join me in thanking the men whose vision and efforts have brought us here today. Bob Brown, our president, who led the way, and Rajan Kilachan, who has opened the gates. Thank you. So now we have a symposium. <laughs> Plato had one first, but this is probably the latest. It's called Innovation and Imagination, and it's designed quite simply to give you a taste of what's going on in the Honors College. When a former president of this university was asked, what is photonics, he said, it is the science of how to turn light into money. <laughs> if so, our first speaker, Thomas Buffano, the director of the Photonics Center, is probably the richest man on campus. He is also one of the finest and most generous people I've ever had the honor of working with. He personally paid for his students' textbooks this year in his freshman seminar. As a result, we've decided that from now on, Tom will be the instructor of record in all university honors college courses. <laughs> That's about 25 next year, so that'll take care of the money problem. Um, even if Tom isn't the richest man on campus, uh, he certainly is one of the most distinguished and the most original, uh, a person who has done sustained, uh, high quality research in mechanical engineering for a long time now. And as you will see, Tom has some of the best toys on campus and he has built many of them himself. His presentation today is called Making Light. Tom. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I've, I've been a professor at BU for 23 years. It's the only job I've ever had. I'm the director of the Photonic Center, as you just heard, and I'm, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to, uh, to share a little with you. It's a little different theme, so uh, you know, that, the last talk, a lot of uh, big ideas. This is more science-y, more about uh, uh, what my class does and it, uh, it's actually shaping light instead of making light. We're, we're talking a lot about what we do with light. And um, so I'm gonna give you a little, I, I'm uh, obligated by my contract to uh, introduce the Photonic Center in every talk that I give. And, uh, and the Photonic Center that I direct is, uh, is a collection of 40 faculty, about 100 graduate students, uh, 10 staff, a uh, business incubator. It's a very thriving uh, place. L a lot of undergraduates uh, wonder what goes on in the upstairs, and, I, and uh, my class is getting to learn that now. Uh, there's, uh, our, our program has become a national resource 
for making prototypes and making photonic technology available to the wider community, to Defense Department, to the biotech sector. We make a lot of uh, prototypes that come out of our laboratories. So a couple of them here, there's uh, one over on the uh, right, your right uh, is an uh, optoacoustic sniper detection system. So this is the kind of thing we do. What we do is we find there's a problem. There's a problem is that uh, soldiers in, in Iraq and Afghanistan are being uh, shot by snipers and have no, uh, no response because the sniper takes one shot and then goes away in an urban environment. And so given that problem by the Army, we, our faculty got together and decided that we could actually bring technology to bear. And we made something that, that actually set the standard in the Army for what, the, uh, what were the requirements for future sniper detection systems. This is very rewarding. And we also make um, uh, bacterial and viral detection systems to be the front line of defense on detecting and finding bacteria. So this is, uh, the, and these end up at military labs. We do the same thing for industry. There I've done it, I've done my photonic center uh, duty. But please come to our website and see what we do. We're also very interested in education. We have summer programs for undergraduate uh, students. If you're an undergraduate interested in doing research, think about joining up with a faculty member from the photonic center. And, um, this is, uh, this is my course. This is uh, Engineering Light. This is what my, uh, uh, I got into this course because I was inspired by uh, Andy Cohn. Andy Cohn talked to me about uh, the Honors College, told me what was going on, and, uh, and, and I really uh, um, asked him if I could be involved in it, and he was gracious enough to, uh, to find a place for me, and I'm very excited to be in this program. My course is, um, is about sh shaping light and engineering light, and we, the central theme in our course is learning by doing. So this, uh, the students who are in my class know that pretty much everything we do, uh, we, we have hands on. And uh, for example, uh, this is up, we went to the Science Museum. Uh, this is a photograph of my class in uh, one of the exhibits at the Science Museum. They're all bent up by the lights in the mirror. Um, but but uh, that was our first field trip. And we do these demonstrational learning experiences in class. The first one we did was we made a light bulb. So we got the patent from Thomas Edison. We saw what he had done, and we recreated that in the, uh, in the lab. And Thomas Edison pulled a vacuum on a glass tube and then set a filament through it. And the students wanted to know, well, what happens if there's no vacuum? And we did that, and there was a lot of smoke. And <laughs> And then we're going to measure the speed of light. We're going to send a laser beam down the hall, have it come back, bounce off a mirror, and see how long that takes. We're going to image our own retinas. I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. We're going to search for planets outside of our solar system. This is something that's brand new. Uh, astronomers have been able to see planets outside our solar system for the first time in the last five years. Uh, we're going to fabricate optical microstructures, and we're going to control deformable mirrors. Now, this last thing is where the class intersects with my research. So I'm going to give you a very quick tour of that. My uh, research, there's a challenge that's associated with telescopes and microscopes, which is that they're both pretty blurry. Telescopes because of the atmosphere, and microscopes that look at your retina because of your corneas. Both of them are blurry. So this is Galileo 400 years ago. He looks up at the sky with the telescope, and this was exciting for him. This is Saturn. You can see the rings, but it's blurry. Let's face it. There's not much there. So 400 years later, go to the Keck telescope. We've built it for $100 million, and here's a picture of Neptune. It's really not that much better, right? <laughs> so this is, you can see a little guy here. That's a guy. That's the telescope. This is Galileo's telescope. Pretty much the same thing. And in your eyes, the doctor looks at your eyes with a thing called an ophthalmoscope. This is a picture of your whole retina. And we're going to take a very little section of that where all the cells are that are related for disease and function of the eye, photoreceptors, capillaries, all that stuff. We zoom in, and this is what we see. It's a little gray blob. You don't see anything there. So that's the problem. Your corneas, the atmosphere. It's, it makes things hard for telescopes and microscopes. My group makes deformable mirrors. Deformable mirrors fix this problem. You stick them into the microscope. You stick them into the telescope. 
Long lecture on that. I have a couple minutes left here. I'm not giving it to you. <laughs> this is what the telescope looks like. So this is the telescope with the DM. And then this is what the ophthalmoscope looks like. This is the same telescope and the same ophthalmoscope, but now you see photoreceptors. These are the things that let you see color. So you suddenly can see that. That changes the game for the ophthalmologist and the clinical researcher. So now all of a sudden we can start thinking about uh, what, what's going on in the retina. So what, how does our group get involved in this? This is, uh, this is myself and a couple of my former students who are now president and vice president of this company, Boston Micromachines. There's about 15 people at that company and half of them are BU graduates and they go about uh, commercializing the technology that spun out of Boston University. So this is a deformable mirror made with semiconductor fabrication tools. We have some of those in the photonic center. This is a cross section of what it looks like and oh no that's not it. There, oh no we can't do that. We'll click on it. How about if we click on it? Oh forget it. <laughs> there. It was not worth it, right? So <laughs> there's, the, there's the, uh, the mirror moves up and down, big deal. All right, so how does this intersect with the University Honors College? What we're going to do is we're going to fabricate optical microstructures. I took this from an engineering class I teach. We go into the clean room in bunny suits. We, you know, we, we spin photoresist. We, uh, we write letters that are 100 atoms tall on a silicon chip and we make that into a letter that they send home to their parents. Here's this says, hi mom, BU is great, see you soon, Ed. They send it home, the parents have no idea what the little chip of silicon says, but you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's fun, they enjoy it. <laughs> and this is the deformable mirror itself, the students will control these deformable mirrors. This is actually a measurement of the deformable mirror moving around with colors corresponds to deflection and it's all very interesting and so the students will get a chance to do that and play with that. Then uh, my colleague uh, Supriya Chakrabarti in the, uh, in the uh, uh, School of, in the Department of Astronomy and I uh, collaborated on a project where we're sending one of these mirrors into space and we're going to look for planets outside of our solar system. It's launching in eight days. So eight days from now, this rocket goes up, hope it doesn't blow up, <laughs> takes some pictures and sends them back. And so how does this relate to the UHC? Our plan is to, is to, when the data comes back, see if the students can see whether the data came back and showed things that, uh, that we were looking for, and then see if the DM still looks good or not. All right, and then another, another place where the UHC classroom re intersects with the research is at Jocelyn Diabetes Center. You know, I told you about the ophthalmoscope makes vision better. So we took one of these ophthalmoscopes, the company in BU, and we gave it to Jocelyn Diabetes Center. And the idea is those are the clinicians. Those are the people who know if this thing is really any good. And, uh, and so here's a picture. You see the dots, those are all photoreceptors. And then we move through and you could see the blood flowing through the capillaries. And then you see these striations, those are nerve fibers. There's gonna be a test. And, <laughs> and those things are the relevant features for people studying eye disease. So we're gonna head over, the UHC class is gonna head over to Jocelyn, image our own retinas. I'm not gonna image the student's retinas in case the university gets uh, worried about. I'm not going to image the student's retinas, but we'll image my retina. And, uh, and uh, we're going to evaluate the sharpness of the images, and then we're going to contribute things back to Jocelyn, try to control the DM better and control the images better. So that, uh, in, in, the, in that way, the students take a small but active part in battling eye disease, which I think is a valuable uh, thing for them to do. And that's it. That's all I had for you. I hope you get an appreciation of how I enjoy uh, merging the research and the, and the opportunity to teach in the UHC College. And I thank you for your time. You know, it's very hard to organize a lineup when you have uh, four cleanup hitters, but I think we're doing that. Leo Tolstoy wrote, historians answer questions Nobody asks. 
took me a while, but I figured out it wasn't a compliment. <laughs> uh, Tolstoy was deeply interested in history, as you know, from War and Peace. But he believed that what historians focused on what was the trivial and irrelevant aspect of the story. Whatever the general validity of this notion, it certainly does not apply to our next speaker, my friend and colleague, Andrew Basevich. In a series of remarkable books and essays, he has used his profound knowledge of history to understand and sometimes to challenge American foreign policy. He answers questions everyone asks, and he courageously addresses questions many people would rather ignore. If you want proof that the blending of reason and passion produce the finest scholarship, read Andy Spacevich's books, take his classes, and listen to what he has to say today. I'll try to get the title right. It's the 20th Century Revised. Andy. So thanks very much. Um, I have an appointment in the International Relations Department and also in the History Department. So in history, we're concerned about the past. Uh, in IR, we're concerned about the present. And as Charles suggested, most of my research and writing really focuses on the integration between the two. What I want to do very briefly this afternoon is talk to you about the course that I'm teaching uh, in UHC. The title of the course is War for the Greater Middle East. But really, the purpose of the course, I think, is suggested uh, here by this title. What we're really examining is the possibility of revising or reinventing the narrative of the 20th century that will have application to young people who are going to live their lives in the 21st century. When I ask myself this question, and there's lots of good answers you can give to this question, that's the answer I come up with. I believe that for citizens, the past needs to be usable. Now, this citizen, you said, sir, that you're 62. I have to tell you, I'm 64. Uh, I am into the realm of old fogeydom. <laughs> I am emphatically somebody whose life is stuck in the 20th century. And I will always have a particular perspective on what the story of the 20th century is about till the day I die, imprinted on my subconscious, that that story really was about, oops, great powers vying for control of East Asia. And the story really is a story of a sequence of great wars. Even when there weren't great wars going on, we re I refer to that period in reference to wars. And that this period ended more or less around 1989 or so. And I have to say, back in 1989, I thought that something really definitive had occurred. That turned out to be a mistaken perception in many respects. Now, this narrative, my narrative of the 20th century, is one that yields a set of identifiable lessons that are probably familiar to anybody in this auditorium who's 30 years or older. And these are parables, parables that tend to appear in political discourse in terms of shaping the way people think about how to address the, the problems that we may, ha may happen to address at any particular time. So introduce the word Munich into any discussion of contemporary policy. And what you're really saying is, this is an issue where appeasing a dictator is inevitably going to induce greater aggression. If you introduce the, the words Pearl Harbor into a discussion, what you're saying is, it's a dangerous world. Let your guard down, and bad things are going to happen. Now, I think that in many respects, these lessons have great and arguably even permanent validity. My problem is that they may have too much influence in a new century, which is quite different than the 20th century that I grew up in. 
Let me give you some example of the way these old lessons are being applied in the 21st century. This is a quote from a book that appeared uh, in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. And in essence, the point that the authors are trying to make is that the response to the 9-11 attacks should be similar to the response made to Pearl Harbor and the onset of World War II, that all-out war provides the appropriate response to violent anti-Western Islamic uh, radicalism. Here's another quote from a uh, column in a newspaper that appeared a couple years ago. The particular issue was the kerfuffle uh, between the Russians and uh, Georgia, in which the author of this column basically is saying, don't th think of this as uh, Russia versus Georgia. Think of this as a reprise of Nazi Germany against Czechoslovakia. Here's another example, the last example from uh, a current presidential candidate discussing the controversy that's happened within the past year about the notion of, of uh, erecting the, uh, uh, the mosque, uh, the Islamic Center, uh, at, at ground zero, and basically comparing the 9-11 attacks undertaken by 19 thugs comparing that to the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 7, 1941, undertaken by Imperial Japan, and likening the two. So this is the way the parables of the 20th century get applied. I'm not sure that that application is appropriate or useful for students in the 21st century. And what we're trying to do uh, is, in our course, uh, is to see if we can expand the range of lessons that could be elicited from a somewhat different narrative. Now, the point is not to say that the received narrative is false or incorrect, rather that to suggest the possibility that's in, uh, that it is inadequate. So, what are we trying to do in UHC HI 101? Here, to try to address that question. Now, again, I know I am a 20th century old fogey. I was born in 1947, Charles, back when people wanted to buy a car that was made in Detroit. My, my parents were both World War II veterans. I spent 20-some years before coming to BU as a serving officer in the United States military, and I say that because when I go into the seminar room with my students, I'm acutely conscious of the fact that I come from a different place than they inhabit. And it seems to me that if we're going to be able to identify this alternative narrative, it's important for us to structure the course and conduct the course so that as much as possible, the students have the lead in deciding where we want this course to go. And that's what we're trying to do. So, I suggested to them at the outset that one, one possible way to begin to construct an alternative narrative is to consider the possibility that the 20th century really wasn't about who's going to oh, who's going who's to dominate Eurasia, but maybe the, the real story was about who's going to dominate that region of the world that we currently call the greater Middle East. Maybe, maybe the competition was not between the West, in many respects, the United States and its allies, and those competitors for power, Germany, Japan, the Soviet Union, maybe the competition actually was for a considerable period of time a competition between the West and the West, between Great Britain and France when they were great powers, between the United States and Great Britain as the United States eclipsed the, the rest of the West. And maybe also it was a competition between the West and, of course, nations and groups in the Islamic world. That was the place that we began. And I said to them, I said to the students on the first, uh, on the first, uh, first day we met, well, what then are the themes around which one would build an inquiry to try to structure this narrative? And we agreed on the themes that you see outlined here. And what we said was, okay, if that's the basis of the course, how did we get here? How did we get to the point where every day in the newspaper we read about this persistent Israeli-Palestinian conflict? How did we get to the point where we are now 
10 years into a war in Afghanistan that now extends into Pakistan. And, and not only do we not want to know how we get here, but then what does this story teach us in terms of lessons comparable to Munich, comparable to Pearl Harbor, that can help 21st century students think about the world in which they're going to live. So we're doing this, approaching this by um, beginning in the present, going into the past, heading back in time. I think we're going to basically probably end up around World War I, heading back toward World War I. Could be we'll get further than that. And, and accepting the possibility that we're going to come up with a story that's going to be significantly different than the story that is my story of the 21st century. How do we do it? Well, we do it by the students collectively. We do that the, at the end of each meeting, the students collectively identifying the questions that we want to undertake for the next meeting. What do you want to talk about? They decide. Now, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Through the first five lessons or so, I feel that I have been too directive. I have not given them enough leeway, and I'm going to keep working on that. But on the other hand, if I'm, if I'm not blowing smoke at you, that's a term we used to use from my previous life, my <laughs> students in this auditorium should be able to identify the questions that we're going to talk about when we meet next Tuesday. So Anisha, are you out there? <laughs> what are the five questions that we have identified for next Tuesday? So next time, we had agreed that we're going to focus on the events from roughly the end of World War II through 1948 to give rise to the Arab-Israeli dispute. Those are the questions that we're going to talk about. Now, were I teaching in the history department or the IR department of CAS, I'd say, OK, here's the three chapters I want you to read, and then come to class and we'll talk about that. That's not what we're doing. Because this is supposed to be a college in which we challenge our exceptionally gifted students to take a much more direct and activist approach to their learning. So the idea is, having identified those questions collectively, it's my students' individual responsibility before coming to class, tapping into all the resources of this university to get their own answers, and then to come to the meeting and share those answers in the course of a structured discussion, at the conclusion of which we then identify the next set of questions for our next get-together. And I'll be honest with you. I'm pushing them. I'm pushing them on this. It is a great big world of knowledge and information available to 21st century students that for 20th century people like me I can't even begin to appreciate. I want to push them to explore that universe and not be satisfied with, you know, Google something and Wikipedia comes up and there's the answer. <laughs> but I'm pushing. And I'm saying that so that you understand. <laughs> OK, now, my understanding of UHC also is that it's clearly our intent to provide our students with an opportunity not simply to learn, but also to create. And the way I'm trying to do that in this course is as follows. The first is that, that each student, individually, has a requirement to make an in-class presentation to the rest of the seminar, to talk about what we call a vignette. And a vignette basically is some relatively small event of large significance and the task is, tell the members of the seminar everything they need to know. Not everything there is to know. Everything they need to know. So there's a judgment here. What are some examples of, uh, of vignettes? Uh, the US shootdown of Iran Air 655. The Israeli attack on the Osirak nuclear reactor. The Iran-Contra scandal. The uh, terrorist attack on the US barracks at Kobar Towers in Saudi Arabia. 
things like that. The second thing, the major written requirement of the course, is to interpret a document. And what this means is your individual students writing for me, what is it? What does it say? Why does it matter? What is the legacy? So examples of some of the documents that they're assigned. One document is the movie Exodus. In my mind, a genuinely significant historical document because what it says about the portrayal of the founding of Israel in popular culture circa 1962. But other examples would be the Balfour Declaration, the uh, Carter Doctrine, the Palestinian National Charter, uh, the uh, Obama, excuse me, the Obama, the, uh, the Bin Laden Fatwa of, uh, of 1996. <laughs> That's another one of those. Uh, yeah, one of those. Right. <laughs> and then finally, they're going to take a final exam. And I tell my course, my students in every course, the purpose of taking a, I don't give final exams to entertain me, because it is not entertaining to have to grade them. I don't give final exams in order to trick you or to show you how smart I am. I give final exams in order for students to have an opportunity to demonstrate their mastery of the material such that I can give them a passing grade. And here I think the challenge is somewhat more ambitious than it would be in the other courses. Because what they're going to need to, what they're going to, need to do is to articulate for me their sense of what this alternative narrative of the 20th century is about and what it has to teach for them, for members of their generation. So that's all I got. Thanks very much. Building and sustaining the excellence of a college requires bringing in and keeping in the brightest young faculty. And that's why we were so thrilled when Andy Cohn approached Mohammed Zaman about coming into UHC. Nevertheless, um, I have a slight beef with Mohammed. I was looking at the program on the way over and I noticed that though I've been a professor for about 30 years, and Mohammed's been a professor for how long? 45. Yeah, okay. His title is about twice as long as mine. <laughs> so I'm having what Freud in an unpublished paper called title envy. <laughs> it's, it's lucky I'm so secure in other ways. Sorry, as my wife, my wife will tell you, I haven't been able to talk for about a week. It's probably been the best year of our marriage as far as she's concerned. <laughs> anyway, I have to admit that Muhammad really more than merits both his titles and his plaudits. He is doing amazing work in a number of different um, areas, and we are really lucky to have him teaching in the sophomore course. The work he'll talk about today consistent part of trying to bring the best of Western technology and medicine to the developing world. I think Gandhi would have approved. I think we will too. His topic is engineering global development, Mohammed Zaman. Thank you, Charles. Um, no comment on uh, <laughs> that point. Um, we live in a in a very difficult world. There's a world outside Boston, there's a world outside the US, there's a world out there that does not have even the basic necessities that we take for granted. This on the top right of your screen is the state of the art drug screening laboratory in Kenya. You see some sort of old uh, boxes, a few things here and there, and this is where they decide whether the drug should go into the market, whether a particular brand of bread is safe or not. It's not all about engineering, and it's all not about chemistry. It's also about the message, understanding what are your challenges, what are the issues that you're dealing with. So my question to you and to me is, what is the job for an engineer? 
in solving these crises? What is something that we can do? And what are some of the challenges that we see in the world? This, uh, this map of the world is a couple of years old from the World Health Organization. Um, and it's not a very happy map. This is a map of the probability, the chances that someone will have to have a fifth birthday. And the chances are pretty bad in most of Africa, parts of South Asia, Papua New Guinea, parts of Latin America. In parts of the world, 200 or more than 200 babies never make it to the fifth birthday. Pretty bad. Most of these disease, diseases come from pneumonia. Now here's another map about something that is common between all of us. Every single one in this room shares that, and that's the cell phone. This is the world cell phone usage map. Every single one of us either has a cell phone or has access to a cell phone. Now these two things seem completely unrelated, and probably they are. Then you go to another thing that is also unrelated. For those of you who haven't taken my class, you'll see a whole bunch of things that are just completely unrelated, uh, and we'll try to tie them together. Here's something that is coming a lot in the news these days, Millennium Development Goals, a goal that we are setting at the United Nations for all of us, every single country, a country where I was born, a country where I live now, a country where I work, a country where I'll probably work next year, Asia, Africa, United States. And these are goals that we want to achieve in the next three years. We set them about 10, 12 years ago, but in the next three years, we want to achieve all of these. And the, these are things, all of these things we take for granted, every single one of them, in this country, in this room, in this, in this university. But these are challenges that most of the world is not going to be able to make it, most of the world, okay? Whether it is decreasing child mortality rate, whether it is promoting gender equity and equality, achieving universal primary education, eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, combat HIV, malaria, and other diseases, ensure environmental sustainability, and develop a global partnership for development. Now let's go back for a second. Three things I told you. The first thing was really, really bad statistics on child mortality, most of it coming from pneumonia. Something else, a cell phone, and the usage of the cell phone across the planet. And then the goal, the challenge, the ambition that we want to have for all of us, every single person living in every single country in the world. What engineers do and what my students did, more so than I did, all of this work was done by my students, I just got out of their way, uh, was to combine these three things together in solving a challenge. And what we did was we developed an oximeter. Now some of you know what an oximeter is, some of you don't, so I'll tell you. An oximeter is this little device, if you go for a regular checkup, whether you are one year old or whatever. Um, but, but you go and you get your sort of little finger into this little thing, and in about 20, 25 seconds, you get two numbers. You get how fast your blood is pumping, your, your um, saturation rate, oxygen saturation rate, and your pulse. These two simple, simple metrics are your first line of defense against pneumonia. Right? The kids who are presenting signs for acute respiratory infection, their pulse and their oxygen saturation rate are the first line of defense. Okay. Now imagine yourself in a situation in rural Zambia, where I work a lot, where there is no power, very poor literacy, but there is a problem of pneumonia. Well, we have to solve it, right? As engineers, as quantitative thinkers, as thinkers, as, as great students of this university, how do you solve it? So what you do is you think about what is out there. Well, there are two things that are common. One is plenty of sunlight, and the second one is, of course, cell phone. Now, you have to think about if they don't have power, how do they have cell phones? That's another problem altogether. We'll worry about that later. But the fact is that somehow, if we are able to design this system in a society where batteries are remarkably expensive and are going to be stolen anyway, how do you solve this problem? Right? So what my students did, and this was about a year and a half ago, they came up with a system where you wear this little thing on your, you can wear it on your, uh, sort of um, across your shoulder, you can put it in your backpack, you can just put it outside, and what it does is it takes old cell phone batteries that people have discarded and it charges them. And people change their cell phones very commonly here, they change their cell phones even more commonly in the developing world. So it charges those batteries. Those batteries go into a device, and that device basically has a simple circuit 
that can measure oxygen and pulse. A typical oximeter, if you were to go to BMC, would cost on the order of $2,000. This costs on the order of $20. Let's see if it works with my student or not. We, he is our, our uh, sort of test case. And in about 20 seconds, you'll see that this device that does not nearly look as cool as Tom's devices, uh, but, but uh, can still do the, the, uh, the job. So you have um, pulse is good, oxygen saturation is good at 98%. Right. This was done entirely and exclusively by my students, people like you, who understood the challenge, who understood the opportunity in cell phones, and who understood what needs to be done. So it addresses the issue in ch childhood mortality, which is coming from pneumonia, access to medical care, and things like that. And it is, it is sort of modular. You can add more things. So we did uh, tests. We t tested the batteries. We were wearing our engineering hats, and we did all the finite element modeling and all of those kinds of things to make sure that if somebody throws it or how robust it is, it is going to work at 100 degree temperature or not, and water and humidity and dust and all of those things. Imagine now if somebody in rural Zambia or rural Ethiopia or Papua New Guinea gets hands on this thing, he or she is able to test up to 7,200 kids by charging the battery only once. And we are testing it now. But that's not all engineering. You have to really think about the impact, the society that you are impacting as students as my students, we ask questions about what is engineering and what is reverse engineering. If somebody's already made it, who owns it? Who should own it? How do you address the IP issues? How do you address the copyright issues? Issues associated with economic realities. In a society where people barely have enough to eat and make a dollar a day, can they afford a $20 device? Can they? What happens then? Who buys them? Who maintains them? If the society is illiterate, if something goes wrong with the instrument, who fixes them? Then if there is a donor and an acceptor, what is the relationship between them? And then, of course, we have other issues which are very important and important for students to understand. Just because you can diagnose pneumonia doesn't mean you can treat pneumonia as well. So if you don't have any treatment mechanisms, should you tell someone that they have pneumonia? How do you fix that? These are complex challenges which are far beyond the engineering realities. I'm not saying that engineering is not important. It's fundamental to addressing these challenges. We have to do that, but we also have to take the long-range view here and understand the public policy aspects, the economic aspects, the sociological aspects, the sociocultural aspects. And then we have to worry about how do you stay in business? If I make these and make a company out of it, how do I get the next generation of these? version 2.0, or version 5, or version 10. And these are things that are important for engineers to work in the real world, but they're also equally important for my sociology students, for my students in economics, in religion, in culture, in international relations. And the way we do that is we have created a system, an online system we call LEAD, Laboratory for Engineering Education and Development, where we ask people to comment on these things. It's completely open source. So I get comments all the way from, from Colombo to uh, Colombia, or from Peru to Pakistan, or from Kuala Lumpur to Karachi. Everybody can participate. Give me his or her input. How do you solve these challenges? How do you address them? What is the problem that he or she is facing in the society? I get 20 to 30 emails just about this every day. Somebody saying, well, I think this is a pretty good idea. You should try this or that. And then we, we, we try to address those concerns not only about an oximeter, about other devices as well. So what I want you guys to do, and I hope I'll be able to convey this in my, in my class when I teach in sophomore level, is that these are system level problems. These are challenges that require engineering to solve, but engineering alone isn't enough. These are problems at the global level. And as citizens of this globe, and as conscientious citizens of this globe, we have the responsibility to solve them, but we can only solve it if we work together. Thank you very much. One of my favorite poems, in memory of W.B. Yeats, which was published at one of the really dark moments of the 20th century, 1940, after Netherlands had fallen, Belgium had fallen, 
Norway had fallen, France had fallen, and only the poet, Auden's own society, England, standing up, W.H. Auden wrote the following. For poetry makes nothing happen. It survives in the valley of its saying where executives would never want to tamper. I love this poem, and yet it makes me very uncomfortable. Uncomfortable in a, in, in a bad way, not in a kind of creative way. And I think it's because Auden is positing a false distinction between the world of affairs and the world of imagination. I doubt that he believed, except perhaps in dark moments, like the spring of 1940, that poetry makes nothing happen, for this simply isn't true. And if you want to prove it's not true, then read Rosanna Warren's stunning poems or take her inspiring classes. For Rosanna's work clearly proves exactly what poetry can do, how in Auden's words, it survives a way of happening, a mouth. Her topic today is imagination. We are complex creatures with many faculties. Five senses are corporeal knowledge, emotion, dream life, as well as gifts for abstract analysis, synthesis, organization, and computation. Poetry is a mode of knowledge, of exploring and representing reality that mobilizes the whole human being. It's a hybrid art that combines music, image making, counting, analysis, and argument, and trains our intelligences to work at high speed with very disparate materials. It is not a decorative art, and it is not, or not only, entertainment. Education in our contemporary technologically driven culture dangerously overemphasizes the analytical and the quantitative while neglecting the arts, the disciplines of the imagination. But emotion fuels thought. And there can be no good science, good math, or good politics without powerful imagination of the sort that my colleagues have just demonstrated to you, I would say. A restrictively abstract analytical mode of thinking is like badly managed agribusiness, say the monoculture of corn, conducted without replenishment of the soil, without control of pollution or concern for health hazards to humans from, say, antibiotics, hormones, pesticides, ill-used. Such an education, like bad agribusiness, produces a high short-term yield and serious long-term damage. Poetry is the center of my life and the core of all my other work, my teaching, my scholarly critical writing, translation, biography. I try to introduce students to this ancient art of spellbinding in order to awaken their full intelligences, integrating the sensory, the emotional, and the rational. In the course I'm teaching this fall, Literature and Hunger, we read classic and modern works, Homer, parts of the Hebrew Bible and Christian scripture, the letters of St. Catherine of Siena, Milton's Paradise Lost, Kafka, some contemporary poems strictly from the point of view of the consumption of food. Day by day, students learn to proceed from observation to analysis to interpretation, drawing on anthropology, theology, psychology, and yes, literary criticism. We ask, what is food? Who eats what and why? Who eats whom? What is sacrifice, human or animal? What makes it sacred? What's forbidden? Why? How does feasting create a community or destroy it, say, in the case of the suitors at Ithaca devouring Odysseus's household? What is starvation? What is disordered eating? Was St. Catherine of Siena a pathological anorexic, a victim of her 14th century culture, or was she a powerful woman helping to shake the, shape this 14th century culture? Why were medieval Catholics in Europe who consumed the body and blood of their broken god every Sunday so obsessed with accusing Jews of eating matzah soaked in human blood, the blood libel? What evidence do we have, and how would we argue it? 
How do we make the meanings in which we live? The marvelously bright and ambitious students in the University Honors College are hungry for knowledge and hungry to think about thinking. And poetry is one way of helping them to do that. I'm going to read four short poems of my own showing a range of themes from fictions of the private life to public engagement. Poem, I have a poem about war and another poem about that interesting topic, money. Lyric poetry isn't only about the little ego screeching, me, 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 though sometimes it seems that way. I'm going to start with two of the private poems, and I emphasize that they are fictions. Moment. When you turn to me, you in bed, still sleep warm against the pillows, I across the room, skirt zipped, stockings on, and you asked so quietly, was that a truthful answer? And outside our narrow third-story window, the Norway maple was poking odd thumbs into the sky, and a skim milk early morning light leaked down the street, down front porch steps, around grimed collars of snowbanks, and the oval Victorian mirror on my dresser reflected all that with odd angles of roof lines, gutters, chimneys jutting in to th its peripheral vision. Your question cut like a knife, so sharpened it slices clean, and the surprised flesh doesn't know for a moment how to bleed. And I answered after a pause in which the strangeness felt like a form of love. No. This poem is an elegy, one of a series of elegies for a friend of mine, who, the writer Deborah Tall, who died of breast cancer, and it has an epigraph from one of her poems. Aftermath, dawn, the moment it was, it was over. Deborah Tall. It was that last euphoric summer between one chemo and another when you looked out your kitchen window and saw the doe standing at the edge of your lawn where the thicket gathers, autumn olive, buckthorn, forsythia, dogwood. And when you stepped outside, the doe stayed still and looked in your eyes, you thought, with a companionable, complicit question and didn't run. You were lightheaded. The doe lowered her nose to shove at the small bundle at her feet, folded up like an awkward deck chair, till then invisible in its hollow of grass. She had just given birth. The fawn couldn't stand but raised its too large head to gaze at you. You were, as you said, already, more or less, posthumous. You took each other in, one of you before, the other beyond fear. Two creatures, side effects on one another, headed in opposite directions. Now here's a poem with a very different kind of tempo and mood. It's called Porta Portese, which is the flea market in Rome. And I'm kind of proud, not, not being an economist, that I wrote this poem about money in the summer of 2008 before certain events in Wall Street. <laughs> and I tell my Roman, my Italian friends, in case they should be offended about my depiction of Rome here, I said it's not really about Rome, it's about Wall Street. Porta Portese. If it once gleamed, if it ticked, if it buzzed, if it oiled eternal youth, if it whispered on an old tape with the sexual lure of infinite cash, if it said, I am your private castle and you are a queen, if it lit a thousand bulbs, if it shaved a thousand hairs, if it declared, God loves you, if it promised to cure hair lips, eczema, scabies, rage, if it clipped hangnails, if it delivered proverbs, if it hugged the ass, 
glass. It's laid out on a collapsible table or a mat on asphalt. Money will change hands. Money will change us all. Change gypsies, professors, Nigerian whores, limping children, drugged babies, iPodded teens, Somali refugees, artists in drag, illegal Albanians, cruising poles. We said one world. We said switch blade, switch banks. The cloaca maxima accepts all currencies. The Tiber leaks yellow between its legs, venereal, venerable, duty-free, luxurious, silken rippling, classical waves, sold and soldered, solved, reflected here. And I read that once in New York, and somebody who, a banker afterwards said to me, you don't really understand money. <laughs> I think I do. <laughs> a military person might say to me, say Andy Basevich might say, I don't understand war either. But here's a war poem. Um, and uh, the Mutanabi Street is the street in Baghdad which is famous for its booksellers. Fire. It would take a voodoo skull, one eye darkened, one candle lit, to see into these pictures. Who set that fire? Who piled that cliff of smoke? The newsprint is jaundiced, ripped at the edge. I set that fire. I piled that bombastic, mountaining smoke. I mound it up every night, and I don't drag anyone out. The bodies are stiff, like little T-squares. It's not clear what geometry problem they solve. The ditch is a rampart. The live ones, turbaned, stand on the upper rim. Bombed trucks burn rectangularly. The books on Mutanabi Street make a chunky oatmeal mush. This world, the same for all, was shaped by no god or man, but always was and will be an everlasting fire, said Heraclitus. And the child in the charred room reaches out to touch the wall. The furniture's burned, his father's shot, the mirror reflects only the camera flash. We found fire in our souls before we stole it from heaven. Now, we are the lords of light, and the dark room is ours. Thank you. I'd like uh, another round of applause for our four amazing faculty members. Thank you all. <laughs> Rajan, will you join me on the stage, please? Could we have uh, more light? Is there? Ah, oh, we do have light. Thank you very much. Um, I. Uh, to commemorate this day, I'd like to make a, a small presentation. Rajan, because of your vision for undergraduate education and the role of the Honors College in educating both our very best and most ambitious students in helping transform education in a great research university, I'd like to present to you over here a plaque to commemorate the
Um, you know, I had no idea until about 10, 15 minutes ago that I was supposed to say a few words. <laughs> Being a businessman, um, we're not really trained to give uh, great speeches. So I'll do my best, but uh, I want to say at the beginning that thank God I went to BU 40 years ago so that I could talk on moments like this. <laughs> um, well, as you know, I won't, it's, it's going to be a little, obviously, a lot of nostalgia. And, uh, but to cut a long story short, in 1971, I landed on the shores of Boston uh, from India, which, um, which was, for me, the first time to the West. On the way, I had to stop in London because the planes didn't go straight in those days. And uh, coming from a country where we had um, just gone through food shortages, uh, our currency was not convertible, we needed an exit visa to leave. Uh, the waiting list for a car was 50 years, for a telephone, 20. Uh, televisions didn't exist. And uh, so it was two completely different worlds. Uh, nevertheless, it's been a great journey. And um, I think. Um, rather today for where I am in life and uh, whatever I've managed to do. Uh, I think the f f when I'm, uh, I tell my children on my rocking chair, I hope a long, long time from now, and looking back, I'm, I think this is going to be one of the uh, defining moments in my life. The first one being, of course, uh, coming to BU. So um, uh, when Bob um, uh, contacted me about, uh, how many years ago, Bob, was it three, four or two something? And yeah, two and a half years ago in, uh, in Dubai, I was pretty much amazed when I got an email. And by the way, you, rem you know, Steve Jobs had just launched his computer when I left the United States in 74. And uh, <clears throat> so the word a computer was pr pretty much alien. Um, I was pretty uh, shocked, and um, because I had really been out of touch uh, with uh, with Boston, and uh, life had taken me towards uh, Europe and South Asia and the Far East. So one thing led to another, and um, we started talking. And um, uh, I, I um, um, expressed interest in doing something for education and something substantial. And um, I said, primarily Boston University. Uh, and of course, then we started discussing concepts. And um, uh, Bob and uh, Scott and everybody came quickly, came, reverted back to me and said, listen, we have a great concept for what you, this, the, the journey of your life that I've been, I described to them. And you know, in a nutshell, uh, this symposium uh, really uh, is a microcosm of uh, uh, you know, I had no idea when I left, uh, I think it was uh, 1974, that um, within f five years I would be, have to become uh, a combination of Einstein, Freud, um, uh, I don't know, a great surgeon, uh, uh, a psychologist, uh, and um, on top of that, uh, live in deserts and swamps, deserts of the Middle East and swamps of uh, Indonesia. And on top of that, uh, be an engineer when uh, I didn't know how to spell the word. So anyway, uh, so here I am. And um, when I, uh, the last few days that I've been here, and actually the last two, two and a half years that I've been visiting here, um, it's been absolutely a, a brilliant journey. And um, as I told, I keep repeating now to Gene and Bob and everybody, I said, um, you know, can I uh, have uh, only one request attached to this 25 million? Is that can I attend a few of the classes up here? <laughs> but for God's sake, don't give, make me give an admission test. I'll never, I'll flunk out, you know? <laughs> so I think uh, all of you are, as we heard, are going to live in this 21st century. And um, it's, it's, it's a fantastic time, and uh, um, 
after today, I'm convinced more than ever that you cannot have a better preparation for what faces you than Boston University. So all the best, enjoy it. Thank you so much, and once again, for my family, thank you for allowing us the privilege of having uh, the Honors College named uh, in memory of my parents. Thank you.